Hi everyone, my name is Adrian Cockcroft. Today I'm going to talk about adding sustainability concerns to development and operations. And I'm calling this DevSusOps and I have the Twitter handle to prove it. You can follow me at AdrianCO or at DevSusOps to follow up with any questions you might have around this. So, why does sustainability matter? You may have various different uh, thoughts about this, but I'm, I think I've got most of them here. The definition of sustainability is really around leaving the world habitable for future generations. That's sort of the essence of the United Nations definition of sustainability. But the reason it matters to most companies is regulatory compliance. What we're seeing is a lot of, uh, particularly in Europe, the uh, regulators are saying you've got to measure and report your carbon footprint and other sustainability risks. And in the US, um, we're moving to, in that same direction and around the world, wherever you are, um, you've got regulations saying you're going to have to figure out what is the sustainability posture of your organization. Then there's market transition risks. If you think um, of companies that say own gas stations or make parts for uh, gas driven cars, that market is transitioning to electric cars. So that's a market transition. If you own a coal fired power station, you're in a market transition. And so it's any time that the market is changing as a result of the transition to a more sustainable future, you have a market transition risk if you're selling products that are affected by that market transition. Then there's physical risks to business assets. If you own property at sea level uh, in very high temperature areas where it's getting hotter and hotter outside, um, you try to move uh, freight down rivers that are drying up or you know, there's all kinds of physical risks that you might have. Sea level rise is, is one that's affecting the coast, but there's a lot of weather and high temperature related physical risks to business assets from climate change. The other thing that you may have is products which are branded in some way to be green. And so the market positioning, you need to stand behind them and you know, walk the talk and actually um, build green products in a green way. One thing that you can't really underestimate, I think, is employee enthusiasm. Um, many of us have children that you know come home from school and say, what are you doing to save the world so that I have something to live in? That's a, a big motivator. And um, a lot of people, you know, I'm a little older, but uh, my kids are grown up, but I'm, you know, it really matters what are we doing for the future and there's a lot of personal investment in this way beyond what you'd expect for just say a cost optimization um, exercise. People get much more invested and excited about a, con a carbon optimization exercise. As we move into a more sustainable future, we're actually starting to see costs come down either now or you're seeing future cost reductions. Like the cost of renewable energy is now lower than the cost of fossil fuels, uh, fossil-based electricity. So we've got current payback right now. Um, the cost of operation of an electric car is less than the operation of a gas car now, although the upfront price is, is still a little more. So with, over time, you see in the future, we'll see electric cars being cheaper than gas-powered cars even to buy in the beginning. And then for some organizations who've got a, a bad history of, of working in climate change, like fossil fuel companies, they're concerned about the social license to operate. Are people still going to be want to go and work there, want to buy products for them if they've got a bad reputation around sustainability? So what can we do about it as developers and operations people? So on the development side, we, we can optimize our code, choose faster languages and runtimes, pick more efficient algorithms, use faster implementations of those algorithms, things like SIMD JSON, for example, so super fast way of processing JSON, use, uh, reduce the amount of logging we do, and then reduce retries and work amplification by getting our, our retry algorithms worked out. That reduces the overall workload. So that's on the developer side, the way you set up your application. And then, you know, on the operations side, whether you're a DevOps engineer doing development and operating it and you run what you wrote, or whether there's a separate ops team, there are more operational concerns. You want to run the code you've built at a higher utilization. That might require tuning the code so that it can run at higher utilization, but 
you want to run at high utilization. You want to use a lot of, a lot of automation for things like auto scaling. You want to uh, relax any over-specified requirements you may have, push back on things that look either expensive or high carbon, and say, do we really need to have, um, you know, retain data for forever, right? So you might want to archive and delete data sooner, uh, deduplicate data. And then the thing that's really uh, you don't normally think about is choose times and locations carefully. If you run something at midday, there's a lot of excess uh, solar capacity. It's the, the grid is very green. Uh, if you run stuff at midnight, then you've got a lot more, um, a lot more fossil fuel in the mix. So that's those. That's really the time-based thing, and then location. Some locations, say if if you run things in France, there's lots of nuclear energy. It's a very clean grid from a point of view of carbon emissions. If you run things in in say Singapore, there's a lot of uh, carbon in the grid there, so it's a, you end up with a very high carbon location. So you go pick those things. And those are things that we'll talk a bit about later, but um, are not the sort of normal con normal concerns. And almost all of these things are directionally the same as saving dollars. So if you save, um, if you just make your system more efficient, you're saving money as well as saving carbon. I say almost all cases because there are a few situations where you might say some regions which have lower carbon may cost a little more than other regions if you look at a cloud provider. So migrating a workload, you might spend a little bit more, but reduce carbon. That's one of the few corner cases that you might see. The main thing is, even though you've got directionally saving money saves carbon, but the actual amount of carbon per dollar varies a lot. So you have to understand whether saving a, do a, a, a dollar of compute or a dollar of storage or a dollar of a, a service, what's the carbon impact of that? So I'm going to spend most of this talk focusing on how to measure carbon and see if I can figure out how to get uh, the right mental models into your heads about how to think about it, the terminology, the way these things operate, so you can figure out um, in your own work how to measure carbon, how to, th how to uh, work in this space. So we're used to reporting and optimizing throughput latency utilization capacity. We've started adding cost optimization to those kinds of things. And carbon is really just another metric for monitoring tools to report. And we're starting to see a few monitoring tools with carbon as, as a metric within them. But what we're really seeing is regulators and market pressure causing companies to have to report carbon and decarbonize their products and services. And these are two separate things. Reporting carbon is something that the board has to do a report and sign off and auditors come in and every quarter you do a financial statement. You're going to have to put carbon in that financial statement alongside the financial numbers in the future. Those are audited numbers. What you need to do to do that is a little different than what it actually, the, the information you need to decarbonize products and services. So do you know, anyone in the audience, do you know how much carbon your company emits for, let's call it, data processing and hosting per year? Um, most people don't really know. But how so how can we get to an answer? So what you may know is your company budget is like what's your IT budget? Most people have some idea whether it's you know a million, ten million, or a hundred million or whatever. It's somewhere in that, that ballpark, right? And what you can do is for every million dollars you spend on say IT or whatever you define as data processing and hosting, it's 159 metric tons of CO2. That's the economic model. So that's just a rule of thumb you can do. If we've got a $10 million budget, we're probably doing you know 1,000 to 2,000 metric tons of carbon. You're in that kind of range. So where does that number come from? So if you go and, and search for, um, for carbon factors, you'll find places like this, climatic.io. You can go on this website, you can search, and you can find that there is a standard number which is provided by the EPA. So this is a government provided number uh, for 2020. So if you are um, operating, you're, you're doing your carbon report for 2020, you go to the EPA number and you find it's a 0.159 kilograms per dollar, which is the same as 159 tons per million dollars. You also notice this is calculated from 2016 data, which is a bit worrying. It's a little bit out of date. 
but also that it includes the entire supply chain cradle to shelf, meaning all the th all of the materials used to make it, as well as the energy used to operate it all the way through. Right. So this is um, quite an interesting number, but it's a very average number for the entire industry. So if you have nothing else, you use this number. So the economic model for carbon, basically, you take your financial report, you break down the spend categories, fight the right emissions factor, multiply and accumulate. So the good thing about this is really everybody uses these models. Most of the carbon numbers you see out there that people are reporting are, are, are largely based on economic models. It's just the way the world is. It gives you a big picture, approximate view. You can always get the input data. The industry standard emissions factors are available. Some of them are openly available. There are some where you might license them to get some more specific ones. Auditors can trace the calculations easily, and it does estimate the entire life cycle. So that's the good. The bad is it's a really coarse model. Some of the factors are based on old data and fast moving areas like IT. They may not be that accurate. It can be hard to actually pick the right factor. And this is one of the hardest things is finding how do you categorize things and pick the right factor? Uh, it's not trivial. And then this other problem is that if you spend more, let's say you, you go and you buy some green product because it's greener, but you spent more on it. And if you don't account for, if you don't have a different factor for it, then your reported carbon will go up just because you're spending more. So effectively, carbon optimizations have no effect. And the ugly thing here is if you do this for one year economic model, and then you come up with a more accurate measure the next year, it could be quite a lot higher. So recommendation here, start here, use spend when no other data is available, use economic models to figure out where to focus efforts. And if you look at your entire business, you're going to see what, what do you work on? Are you working for a SaaS provider where or a bank where almost all your costs are people and IT and office buildings? Right? In that case, maybe most of your carbon footprint is IT. If you're, um, and I, I did a talk with Starbucks um, earlier this year, or late last year, there was most of their carbon footprint is dairy, it's milk. Their IT component is a very small piece. So if they can use a little bit more IT to, uh, to use that to convince people to maybe use oat milk instead of dairy, that actually makes a bigger difference like a small percentage change in Starbucks as end users from, from dairy to you know, real milk to oat milk will actually make more difference than their entire IT budget. So you have to think about you know, what is the real carbon footprint of your company. Don't just focus on the IT component. So I'm going to now explain something called the scopes of carbon with some slides I, I made a year or two ago while I was at AWS. So the first thing is the fuel you consume. And this is create, you count what whoever owns the fuel when it's being burnt, right? So the fuel, you buy gas, you put it in your car, you drive it around, that you are now doing scope one emissions for whatever you put in the, the car. Anything you burn in your fireplace or, or gas used to heat your home, anything used for cooking, that's scope one. And the way to get rid of scope one is to electrify everything and then move on and then figure out how to get renewable electricity. Scope two is really the energy used. And so this is the energy where it's consumed, but you're not burning the fuel yourself. Somebody else burnt the fuel, gave, sent you electricity. So you have the grid mix, which is the mix of power, which is either renewable or fossil fuel. I mean, you could break it down, but those are the two main categories. Uh, what you want is, is carbon emitting and non-carbon emitting. So nuclear is, and is good uh, because it doesn't emit carbon, right? So we'll, we'll include nuclear. Nuclear isn't really renewable, but it counts as, as, low, as zero carbon. So that's kind of the way you look at the grid mix. And then you look at your, your, your location, say your house, You've got a heat pump, solar panels, batteries, electric car. You've managed to convert that house to be all electric. And then if you can uh, run the house off the batteries and the solar panels, um, you're basically getting your, your, your scope two to be very low carbon. And then if you're doing cooking, you should switch to induction and electric cooking because also gas ranges cause pollution and things like that. So some of the benefits aren't just carbon. There's other, other things that make it better to move off of fossil fuels.
Scope 3 is where it gets really complicated, depends an enormous amount on what kind of business you're in, it's your supply chain. So the point here is that say you, you had part of your business that was emitting a lot of carbon and you said, well, I'm just going to buy that as a service from somebody else so I don't have to count that as my carbon. Well, that's part of your scope three, so you can't get out of um, can't get out of uh, your carbon emissions by just offshoring it and sending it out and pushing it out to suppliers and say, well, I don't own this thing. So any business that you don't own, which is supply chain, and also the cost your consumers, um, the carbon your consumers emit to use your product, also can count. And in some cases, the inventory, the things you own, those things count as scope three as well. So think about this as pretty complex and extremely dependent on what kind of business you're in. If we look back at data centers, uh, really the only scope one you'll see in a data center environment is a backup generator, and they run diesel mostly. Uh, what we're doing to decarbonize those is put in larger and larger battery packs, so the diesel is a really a secondary backup, doesn't get used very often and also move to biodiesel and uh, fuel cells and other things like that, which can be fed by cleaner data sources, cleaner energy sources. So it's possible to you know, work on that, but it's a tiny component of data center energy. Backup generators really don't run that often. As I mentioned, scope two is this mix of electricity sources coming into the building. And for a data center, scope three will be the building itself, the uh, racks and re coming in the all of the things anything used to deliver the components to physically put up the building that's all going to be your scope three if you look inside a data center you can see there's cooling power distribution heat there's a lot more going on there we'll look into that a bit more later so ultimately um, your suppliers need to report scope one two and three to you and then you need to report scope one two and three to your consumers and this is all defined by the greenhouse gas protocol. And you can have many happy hours reading this uh, website to figure out for your particular kind of business what you have to do. So that's uh, we've talked so far about the economic models, just using num using financial data to feed the carbon data. So if we want to get a bit more accurate, what we need is a process model where the units are the, the materials you're using or the kilowatts of energy you're using. So the process model, you measure the materials, you find the right emissions factor, multiply and accumulate. For example, diesel and gasoline will have different, and, and jet fuel will have different uh, emissions factors, right? Even though they're all measured in gallons or kilograms or whatever. So what you end up finding is that this is called a life cycle analysis. That's what that cradle to shelf um, component uh, of that uh, metric I, I highlighted earlier was talking about. And what you really want to do is look at manufacture and delivery, which is your supply chain, your energy, which is your use phase. And then what do you do once you're done with it? How do you dispose of it? Do you recycle it? What's the energy consumed there as well? So the good thing about these models, um, they exist. Uh, you can. It's a well-defined methodology. LCA has standards around it. People are trained in it. Um, you can um, hire people or, or consult with people that can generate these models. They're reasonably detailed and accurate, particularly for the use phase. Energy data is fairly easy to get. And when you do an optimization, it really does reduce the reported carbon. So you, you're in the right area. And auditors can trace those calculations. The bad thing is models are really averages for a business process. This is not going to tell you the actual carbon emitted by a one machine in your data center running one workload. It's going to give you an average for the whole thing. It's still quite a lot of work to build an LCA model. It may be ex more expensive than you'd want to spend to hire the right people to do it. The supply chain and recycle data is particularly hard to get. And quite often people build these models and they just do the energy part and they don't think about the scope three part or they just don't get to it because it was hard then they just report carbon so the ugly part here is some people just really focusing on energy use and report well we're green because we're 100 percent green energy and then get surprised when say yeah but all of that hardware you're using emitted an enormous amount of carbon when it was being made and you have to count that too okay so what you should do is use the economic models to tell you where most of your carbon is, then build process models for those. Start with energy, but don't forget the rest of the life cycle. So how hard can it be to figure out how much carbon is coming out of a workload? 
here's sort of a zoomed in look at that um, data center. You get grid mix from your local utility bill, which you usually get a month or so after you've used the electricity. Uh, that's kind of annoying because you don't means you don't know what today's uh, energy mix is. You just know what last month's was. And then there's power purchase agreements or renewable energy credit purchases, which I'll explain a bit later, which is basically uh, affecting your grid mix. And then you have power usage efficiency, which accounts for losses and cooling overhead as the power that comes into the building is delivered to the rack. So the machine may use a kilowatt, but you might have to, there might be, say, 10% extra energy which went to the cooling and distribution area. So 1.1 kilowatts have to come into the building to, to provide that energy. So scope 2 carbon is going to be the power mix multiplied by the PUE, multiplied by, by how much capacity you use, and then the emissions factor per capacity. So the amount of CPU you used or storage, and then you'd have a different emissions factor for CPUs and storage of different types, networking, whatever. So a few problems here. First of all, these utility bills are going to be a month or more late. Uh, the, uh, the further you get into the developing world, the harder it is to get this data, and the more delayed it's likely to be. And then I mentioned power purchase agreements. These are contracts to build and consume power generation capacity. So Amazon has over 15 gigawatts of these. So basically, Amazon contracts with somebody else to say, we're going to give you some money, and, and you're going to build a wind farm or a solar farm and we're going to buy the energy from that farm at a certain price usually lower than the typical price that you'd get if you just went to say PG&E and say you know PG&E is whatever it is 20 something dollar cents per kilowatt hour you could get much less than that if you build your own solar so it saves money and you're funding the creation of a new solar wind or battery plant that would not otherwise exist by entering into this contract. So this is good because it's what's driving a lot of the rollout of solar wind and battery around the world. Now, if you're um, if you just sort of fund building your own solar array or wind farm, and you're just selling that capacity to to PG&E or to whoever comes by, one of the things you can do is sell additional the, the fact that it's renewable, you can have to charge a little surcharge to say, this is renewable energy, and I'm going to allocate that to somebody. So anyone, companies can go and say, I want to buy some renewable energy, renewable energy credits, and you know they're going to get used once. So once everyone's bought all the credits for all of the uh, um, solar that's kicking around in the market, you, you're out, right? So there's only a certain amount of this capacity available because it's the open market for unused, uh, otherwise unused power. So it's not quite as good as a PPA, but it's still good. You're still, you know, funding somebody with a bit of extra money for the fact that they built a solar farm and it makes them more profitable and it means that, you know, ultimately more solar farms get built or whatever, right? But it's not as direct as a PPA. And what, what typically happens is companies do PPAs, as many PPAs as they can. Once they've got all of those in place and this is, okay, we've done everything we can possibly do. We have a bit more money. We'll buy a few recs on the side. It's a much smaller proportion than the PPAs for the large cloud vendors. But you're buying a few recs to just top it up and sort of, you know, help, help things out. All right. So the grid mix itself, another problem it's not constant. It's going to change every month. So whenever you look at a carbon number, you have to say, when was that carbon number? Right? It's, there isn't just a carbon number. You have to say, was, it, was that in what year, what month, even down to what hour was it? Uh, because now we're starting to see hourly 24 by 7 grid mix coming from some suppliers in some parts of the world. And this is going to take a long time to get around everywhere. GCP, Google, um, really started driving in on this Azure are working on it AWS have not said anything about it yet but you know hopefully working towards it and you can there's also a company called Flexidao working in this area you could go look at what they're doing um, they're working with GCP and Azure and other people and one of the problems here is that the cloud carbon footprint tool doesn't include PPAs. It really only runs off the public grid mix. It can't really know how much you get from the PPA because that's private information that isn't shared. So it's, it's all difficult. 
If we look at PUE, not well standardized, the different architectures of different data centers mean that you can come up with differences that, that really aren't comparable. Like, do you have a centralized um, power distribution system or, or a distributed one? Are you delivering high voltage um, AC or DC all the way to the racks? Are you, do you have your batteries in every rack or centralized? It actually makes a difference to the way PUE is calculated, to, um, how you do that. Lots of discussion about that in this blog post. Now, if you look at the capacity, um, dedicated capacity is relatively easy to account for, maybe in a data center environment. But once you get into the cloud, it's really hard to figure out how much you're using of a shared service, network equipment, sliced, slices of instances, your virtual machines, really tricky. Um, you can get roughly in the right ballpark, and that's those are the factors we've got, but, but you can't really know what you're doing. And then there's this other problem. If you're operating a multi-tenant service and want to report the carbon to your customers, then you have a problem figuring out how much capacity to allocate to each customer, how much is overhead that you should own yourself. And this AWS is having to solve this. You know, all the cloud vendors basically are having to solve this problem um, for their customers, and all of the SaaS providers running on the cloud are then having to do it downstream. And then we get to the emissions factor per capacity. You need to know how much power every instance type storage class or service uses. Um, depends on if utilization, overheads. It's actually very difficult to figure this out. Um, you can get some averages. There's some data for some systems. But in the cloud providers sort of roll all this up and you know, some provide some estimates, but you know, it's not, it's all of these things are estimates that are in roughly the right ballpark is probably what you'll get. Like I wouldn't worry about if you get a number for an instance that looks vaguely similar on one cloud provider to another cloud provider, I'd just use the same number for the emissions factor. Okay, so if you're going to report carbon and it's going to be reviewed by the board and the auditors and all this kind of stuff, you really need to be using the cloud vendor reports. That's kind of what AWS and Azure and, and, and Google have those kinds of reports available. And if you're on-prem, you need to use economic models probably or build your own models. The data, auditable data, has to be traceable and defensible, but as I mentioned, it's too coarse and it arrives too late to be useful for optimization. And then on top of that, there's two different ways of reporting carbon. So I'm going to try and explain the difference between location and market-based metrics. So if we look at the location base, this looks at a particular building and it says, what is happening at this building? There's the grid mix coming in. If, if I use an incremental extra kilowatt hour of energy, how much additional incremental carbon will be, will be consumed supplying me that extra incremental you know, kilowatt hour of energy. That's the idea for location-based. And it comes up with higher numbers for carbon than the market-based method. And it's typically what's happening. Um, the Google data, the hourly 24-7 data is sort of based on this. The problem with it is that the way it's defined, it does not take into account the power purchase agreements, which you know, the cloud vendors are spending an enormous amount of money on. So um, what, what's used in that case is a market-based method that says all of the electricity in a market is all the same. You pump electricity, you push electrons into the, into the grid, they pop out of the grid. If I have uh, 100 megawatts I'm putting into the grid from this power station here, I can use it over here and it's fine. It just flows through the grid. And I want to take into account the fact that I am generating this power and it's my power and I've got the PPA or the REC in place. So the market-based method includes the PPAs and the RECs, and you effectively are creating a custom grid mix for your data centers, and it's usually averaged over a month. So the reason this matters is that basically your AWS and Azure data is regional market-based, and they take into account PPA generation and RECs that are within the same grid, so that electricity flows uh, together. Um, Google's had a claim since 2017 that said that they generate more energy than they use, and they're taking that on a global basis, which is a bit dodgy, really, because they were basically saying we generate more power than we use in the year, but 
you know, they were basically over-generating extra power in USA and Europe and saying that's good, but Singapore, you're still emitting uh, a lot of uh, coal-powered and oil-powered um, a fossil fuel generation. So they were saying on average across the whole world, it made sense, but it doesn't really, you really want to be, it makes sense if you do it at the regional market level where the grid is, is connected. But then Google went to this sort of more current data is location-based API and 24 by 7, their API work. You can't compare the numbers between AWS Azure and Google because of this, but the Google data is more useful for tuning work and their API is really the, the most useful API if you're trying to build some tooling on this right now. And over time, as the utility grid decarbonize, it matters less. So, you know, if you're in, if you're in France where it's almost a completely carbon-free grid, it really doesn't make much difference. It'll make a bigger difference if you're in Asia. So what can you do today? For workload optimization, we need directional and proportional guidance. So the Cloud Carbon Footprint tool, up next, is open source, uses billing data as input, maintains a set of reasonable estimates or guesses for carbon factors, but you know your, your mileage will way vary as to the actual data you get out of that. I wouldn't put it in a, a, in a in an auditable report, but it's useful for tuning. Um, the Green Software Foundation has come up with a software carbon intensity standard. This is a model for reporting software impact per business operation, like you know grams of carbon per transaction or per page view or whatever, uh, and they're, de they're defining that standard. So it's worth going to look at that. And AWS has the well-architected pillar for sustainability, which I helped write uh, and get out about a year ago. Uh, it's uh, the guidance on how to optimize development operations for carbon. Took some good advice in there. So just to wrap up, where is all this going to be in a few years' time? I think most monitoring tools are going to report carbon as the data becomes more available. Eventually, all the cloud providers are going to have detailed metrics. I think we really, Google's got detailed metrics now. Microsoft has some if you know where to look. Um, AWS really is, doesn't have detailed metrics at this point, but I think we're all going to get there. And then the Europe and US cloud regions are pretty close to zero carbon now if you take the PPAs into account. There's a lot of generation offsetting the energy used. Asia is, everyone has the same problems. And the Asian regions, probably in the next few years, are going to get to zero carbon. Um, it's just regionally been very difficult to get solar and wind projects in place. So any questions you have, happy to discuss it now or later, or um, you can DM me or, or, or send me messages on, on Twitter. And uh, that's what I've got. Thanks very much.